Hi, it's Mark Owen from Moose, marketing and PR, the editor of Punchline Magazine, and welcome to Punchline Talks, the business breakfast briefers, where I gather a panel of business experts to review today's national newspapers, find out what's happened in their business sector and their own businesses, and finally, what's caught their eye in this week's Punchline. I've got a fantastic panel, so let me introduce them straight away. We've got Patrick Downs, Managing Director of Trust in Property. Nice way there, Patrick. Tim William, the leader of the Forrester Dean District Council, Jonathan Viney, director of JV Group, and Peter Glanville, managed director of WCD Group. Welcome, guys. Welcome to Punchline Talks. Anyway, we're going to kick up the newspapers first of all. Uh, I always like to go through the title. So it looks like holidays are off. That's what they're saying. The, the sort of mutant variants of the Indian, um, Indian uh, COVID. Is, is basically causing lots and lots of problems. And, it, and there's a story in the Times today about five flights coming back from Portugal with over 20 people with COVID. And that seems to be the reason why the government has changed its stance of COVID and changed it from being green to amber. So anyway, let's go through the titles. So we've got the Times, first of all, Britain's rush to council holidays. Summer holidays plunged into chaos, says the Daily Mail. The Mirror, Brits follow foreign holiday nightmare. The Daily Express, summer holiday blow for millions. The Eye, holiday in the UK to save June the 21st. Kind of makes sense to me, but we could chat about that. Holidays in doubt, Portugal goes amber, says the Daily Telegraph. The Guardian, number 10 tightens borders and travel rules of variant spark new alarm. The Western Daily Press, furious thousands space holiday chaos. The season completely different. They've gone on the uh, Derby clash between Bath and Gloucester being called off. A little bit behind the news there. The Sun, news flash. The news readers just wearing his shorts. Just wearing his shorts as he's reading the news. And finally, my favorite paper at the moment, who going up, always doing something daring to be different, is the Daily Star. And they've got a selection of all squares that contains clueless clowns who are ruining our summer holiday. And they've got our political leaders all dressed as clowns on the beach. Anyway, let's start with Patrick, please. Patrick, what have you picked out for the papers, please, sir? Morning. Thank you, Mark. Um, I Well, I've zoomed straight in, actually, on the front of the Telegraph, I think it is, this morning. Um, working from home to stay until after the 21st of June. I think this is um, obviously COVID related, uh, as so many stories are. And the, the impact, I think, is the point that um, there's clearly evidence, which uh, goes on to say later in the paper, actually, there's evidence that the working from home does improve or decrease the COVID spread quite considerably. And I think that's probably as much as anything about transportation um, and, and obviously the workplace. But I think a lot of workplaces are very, very safe these days. There have been a lot of measures put in to offices especially, but also to factories and, and, and warehousing. So I think um, the point really is that we're going to be made to stay at home. And I think where I am on this is that that'll be fine if people see it as a genuine reason and that that, that does prevent the spread genuinely. I think people will be prepared to stay at home. But I see on, on here an enormous amount of people sick to death of working at home now. Uh, and really keen to get back into some sort of pattern and some sort of work work performance, really, as well, working with others. And I, there's undoubtedly, um, from a property perspective, all sorts of knock-on effects that if we are to stay working from home, um, that actually I think will later unleash a bigger demand in the property markets, both on the commercial side and on the residential, because we're being held back at home. So we're going to unleash more uh, rather than less later on. And everybody's still reporting that we might want to uh, stay away from the offices and shut them all down and, and try and find a reuse for them. But actually, I, I think, you know, we have short memories and um, we'll be desperate to get back to it as soon as we can. So I think that will have uh, a, an impact. Only yesterday, I think it was Apple reported that they wanted everybody back in the office by September. Well, that's a business drive, of course. Um, it's not necessarily going to be allowed if, if government has restrictions. 
but clearly even these big companies now are saying that this is this is the place to be this is where we want our workforce um so yeah I, for me that, that that's quite a significant move if that's the case i mean who knows all this talk about the 21st just goes on and on doesn't it and well, no one really knows quite, quite interesting patrick um we have a, a lot of clients in london larger blue chip companies and a lot of them are reporting uh, not looking to get a full complement of staff back till september october mm. um mm. this year and even then there's this big debate about work from home, you know, go to work. I think it's about finding that balance, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I think there's, there's yeah. such a huge knock-on effect to the high street, though, and to the businesses that, that surround the, the offices. Let's be honest about it. That's where, that's where all these other businesses, the cafes, the restaurants, the retail, are built around people actually being in offices and, and going out. I always remember when Gloucester Prison closed near me, in um, um, on, on from Westgate Street, a lot of the little shops and coffee shops all suddenly mm. struggled. They were completely wiped out with the, the people yeah. coming to visit the loved ones in in, in prison, uh, whichever way you want to look at that kind of side of things. But they used to pick up things from the local shops and, and go to coffees and, and buy coffee. Uh, and of course, that business wiped out. And it's like that at the moment. Uh, okay, let's move on to Tim. Tim, what have you picked out for us on today's? news please well it's going on the effects of covid is still with us and all that mark but actually it's um it's talking about there's winners and losers within this isn't it and i read in the times this morning that profits at the owner of b&m more than doubled last year mm. the shoppers flocked to the discount chain during lockdowns as a result of the growth b&m is raising its final dividend by 140 percent meaning a £697 million payout to shareholders. Yeah. So when you, consider, you know, when you consider the number of businesses that struggled so much through the last, the last years, and you've got major businesses such as this that are paying that, it, something doesn't quite sit right with me somewhere when, 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 with that. And, I, you know, free economy and all that, and I know there was nowhere else to go, bar the supermarket and hardware chain, but even so, that doesn't quite sit right with me. But Tim, they're a pretty slick business at the end of the day. Yes, they're, yes. they're very well done, well run. Unlike some of the other players that aren't there anymore, they got yeah. it right. You know, Absolutely, it right. yeah. Okay, uh, and, it, was stacked, it was stacked for them. Yeah, no, good luck to them, and, and well that. But I, I just, you know, I'm just thinking of all the other smaller companies that have gone by the way, and you know, it just, it just seems a little sad. Is it because you don't like the shareholders getting the money, or is it, you know, that the money's gone there? I think it's because money's gone there, really. That, that's the thing, you know. Were, were there a lot of other independent chains or, or that couldn't open, uh, smaller ones that couldn't open, that weren't allowed to open, uh, or couldn't afford to open because they couldn't do the uh, the correct procedures for COVID, that might have gone under. I don't, I don't know. It's, it's, it just seems that a large amount of money just goes to show there's winners and losers when it comes to COVID. Well, there's, there's anything like this. There's always winners and losers. You know, in the first and second world war. People yeah. made lots of money on the back of it. It's, that's the way it is, unfortunately. That is business. That's what we all do. Yep. Okay, thanks ever so much for that for now. Tim, oh, over to you, Pete, please. Welcome to Punchline Talks. Pete, now what have we picked out for? There's, uh, I suppose, similar on, on those lines. There's an article uh, in, in the mail just um, highlighting, I always like to look at everything positively, um, just how the UK service sector is starting mm. to roll back in, into life after mm. COVID. And, <clears throat> you know, it is really interesting. You touched on it, Patrick. People have been pent up at home. They're desperate to get out and spend money. Yeah. And, you know, the, the, the service sector has been hit so hard. It's just really positive to see them bounce back. And again, I've, I'm hoping that includes the smaller companies, Tim, as well as the, the large companies as well. And it's it's a good news story for Friday. Everybody likes a happy Friday. That's very true. No, very, very true. Have you picked out another one for us, Pete? Um, oh, I've, I've got a few. Uh, one a lot closer to my heart was um, in the Daily Mail, crackdown on, on rubbish and the environment. As, as a company, we're doing a lot to try and ban single-use plastic. And it's a big article um, just on, in effect, fly tippers and, and stuff like that. And, and it's something that, it does great me. 
I mean, you've only got to go to local um, fast food takeaways and, you know, you look around their car parks and, you know, the bins are overflowing and there's rubbish always thrown on the floor. Uh, and it's just how do we combat that through education to, to better improve the environment and the countryside? Yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't agree with you more, mate. I, th I think, I think we're, I, it's sort of no, no defence, but I think we're better with rubbish on the streets, especially, and, and around the countryside than we used to be. I mean, I remember when I was a kid, it was terrible, you know, some of the events and that. We used to have a lot of rubbish behind, didn't we? But, but I, on the other hand, I think um, we are exceptionally bad at waste uh, in, in, yeah. the, in, the, in the bulk yes. term. Um, and I think, you know, we do need to think a lot harder about reusage and not recycling, but reusage yeah. waste, uh, because I think that's a, a missing point more often than not. But I think the big thing... Yeah, I would say, I'm not sure <clears throat> the behaviour has changed. If, if it has, it's for the worse. When you look at Cheltenham and the Parks last year, yeah, and the... it was cleared because people are putting in place to clear. I don't think people clearing it many years ago when we were younger, but I think the littering problem possibly is worse than people's respect for that. And that... It, it, it's been very difficult with, with COVID coming in and companies having to be forced back to single use plastic. Just pre COVID, there was the, the David Attenborough Blue Planet ban single-use plastic and everybody was really on that journey and what's happening now um, because of COVID you know single-use got brought back in nobody wanted to reuse cups and, and stuff like that so it's almost kind of created an issue again. Mm. I think it comes back around I, I do think there is a sea change though there is uh, and companies definitely you know, yeah to um, Sainsbury's and you, and you, and um, you know the way they pack it the steaks nowadays. You know, seventy percent less plastic. It really is quite phenomenal what some of the companies uh, have done now. Right, let's quickly move to Jonathan. Jonathan, let's. Uh, what stories have you picked out for us today, please, sir? Well, <clears throat> I was kind of um, thinking a little bit about uh, where does people take their businesses going forward. So, as Tim, you said, people at the moment they're all winners and losers. Uh, some of those winners have just been a consequence of being in the right place. Others have adapted and, and pivoted um, and changed what they do. But um, I was told by a story in Telegraph about the new super jet. I don't know if you can see that nowhere. Um, my yeah, back screen is all going to pick it up. But um, the American airline um, has, uh, ordered a number of yeah. these super jets that are going to fly. <clears throat> That's this. Yes, thank you. Uh, over a thousand miles now that they're, they're resonating back to Concord. So there's a little bit of link <coughs> from South Gloucestershire there. But it made me think about everybody is looking at today, um, but what's going to happen tomorrow? <coughs> Who's making those bold steps <coughs> for the future? Um, and where do we go from travel? I'm, I'm sure you remember the disaster of 2000, uh, of the uh, Twin Towers. And I was working at Bodo at the time, doing a lot of uh, international travel. And there was a very, very clever British Airways advert. I don't know if you remember it, but there was a, a guy, in a, an American guy in an American office, uh, secretary comes through and calls up and says, uh, there's a uh, Peter on the phone from the UK for you about that tender. Yeah, hi, Pete, how you doing? Yeah, I've got it in front of me. I'm just looking at it. Then it cuts to, oh, hi there. I've got Tim in the uh, foyer. Do you want to meet him? Tim comes through, big pattern. Yeah, I've got the contract. I'm ready to sign it. And it made this point about even though people didn't want to naturally travel due to a different disaster people reverted back to that normal behavior and that people and the bit you were saying Patrick the interaction between us as humans is a natural thing I had an all day meeting yesterday in a hotel in uh, Cheltenham with dinner afterwards it was an investment deal for one of my clients that wasn't going to get done over a Teams or Zoom meeting I think the so thing is what the right. business is doing now and that's a pretty major investment People do want to go back to the way things were. I mean, I, I went to Rob Freeman's uh, wake and um, you know, it, was, it was a very sad event. And there were quite a few people, but, but straight away, people were shaking everybody's hands. There was none of this, there was none of this uh, elbow bumping and things like that, that we've all been doing or fist pumping. It was all back to shaking hands and mm. a lot of hugging and things like, like that, that going on. Yeah, I think, I, people... I, I think my, my punchline topic actually is, is about Zoom when we come on to that. But interestingly enough, you know, from running a company, our, our, our 
travel and entertainment has reduced drastically during the last 12 to 18 months. But now it's about finding that, that balance where, you know, as opposed to traveling to London sort of like bi-weekly, can it be done quarterly with bi-weekly Zoom meetings? You know, I, I don't think you'll ever take away face-to-face -face meetings. You have to see the whites of people's eyes in certain situations. And, you know, the, the, the grayness, the, the moments of pause that you don't get on a Zoom. On a Zoom, it is very structured and it's very agenda driven. And when it's over, it's over and everybody just clicks off in a meeting. You all still sat around. Uh, and uh, as you touched on, Jonathan, the, the old human brain, you know, a lot of people don't like silent. So when you're in a meeting and all of a sudden everybody starts talk, stops talking, you know, you start to see people's reactions. Yeah, it's all about. I, I, sorry, about right, I, was, I was just, just going to say, it's really interesting that you guys, as business people, which I don't count myself a man, are all saying you want to get back to those meetings, and that within local government, there's been a huge outcry that the government are making us go back to mm. um, having meetings in the chamber. A lot of that's down to cost, of course, but also people want to carry on having having Zoom meetings and having council meetings over, over the internet. So it's really interesting that you guys as businesses you know, want, want to push forward that and, and local government's perhaps pushing away from it. And I think there's evidence that local government has been slow to reopen venues as well. And, and, and you know, whereas we're, other business uh, activities are getting back together and reopening, some, some, some venues are very slow. The hub's slow, isn't it? Um, you know, throughout Gloucestershire. And I think um, it... it it's a big question mark that is from my perspective as to whether that leadership from the public sector and ultimately central government um, should be stronger in this regard, really. If we're yeah, allowed to open, why don't we open? Yes, what, what, what sort of areas you're talking about, Patrick? What, what, what sort of areas haven't opened up quick enough for you? Um, well, I think some of the car parks were open straight away. Um, certainly some of the, the um, sporting venues and uh, didn't open immediately when, when they were able to. Um, the, the Gloucestershire um, Chief of the Hub hasn't opened yet to the university, a lot of, and the university's not open either, is it? A lot of the universities throughout the country are not open yet. And I think that this is slow, really. If, if we're able to do it, most people are saying the sooner we can do it, the better, because the economy overall starts to get going again. Now, it's always tempered with the health issue. Of course it is. But, it, you know, if we're saying it's safe to do it, why don't we do it? Yeah, I mean, I, don't, I mean, there obviously was a lot of health issues with opening re leisure centres and things like that, but also there's an enormous cost that we yes, need. okay, a lot, okay. Of, a lot, of, a lot, of, a lot of councils like like mine would have found reopening and then closing again cost the council a great deal of money because yeah. you have to subsidise the people that are running it and things like that. So anyway, let's um, no, that's all very 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 interesting. One of the big things that I've heard for the grapevine is planning people working in planning departments not willing to go out and actually go and inspect. And that's been a big issue for lots of companies and it's just ground the whole system to a halt. And I think the big issue here is that business people, they have to make money. They've got their overheads, they've got their staff. Let's be honest about it. If you're government based, you don't have to make the money. Yes, you've got to make savings, uh, but there's a big difference between the two really. And we're all responsible for the staff that we have the people that work for us, not on the health side, but actually on their on their on their upkeep, on their on their financial uh, state, and that's the big difference. Right, we're gonna we're, time is going quite quickly, so Tim, I'm gonna come back to you if that's okay. We're in a meeting yesterday. There's a 20 million pound bid to revive Cinderford, Lydney, Colford, the whole of the Forest of Dean. Can you give us a bit of an overview, please? What that was all about. Yeah, it's, it's part of the levelling up fund, Mark, that was announced by the, the Chancellor in his um, spending review, I think, in April. Um, the Forest of Dean, alongside Gloucester City, I believe, have been named as um, area, category one areas that, that need um, levelling up. Um, so we decided that we, we would put a bid in for this, this fund, and we, we found some good partners in Hartree University and College, and also Sinford Town um, Council. And we're looking to do a, con uh, a connective bid for, as you said, £20 million pounds that will bring a centre of sports and recreation and leisure um, facilities on one of the sites. 
It will give Hartbury a new innovation center um, up, on, up on their site and also take over some, some and adapt some former unused buildings in the center of Sinford Town for community and business use and, and, and education within the center of Sinford. It's, it's, it's all around it, you know, those, those old cliches, as I said to you yesterday, you know, game changer and, and turning point, but it really is once in a generation opportunity here in the forest we, we don't we we like to think of ourselves well balanced we're, we've got a chip on both shoulders down here you know we think we're left out of, of many things and quite often just because you're paranoid it doesn't mean you're wrong um but this is a real opportunity for us then and we're, we're, we're trying to be positive we're grasping it our mp is championing it as, as much as he can so i i'm really pleased and looking forward to uh, the outcome of the bid hopefully in the autumn well, I think it's fantastic and it's it's brilliant that everybody is at long last seem to be in the same canoe, paddling up the same way, which is which is great. And the fact that Monmouth, you know, you're talking to other counties now and you and you're connecting together for the first time as well, isn't it? Yeah, we went. But I took over as leader in I think it was um, June, July 2017, and just before Christmas that year, we had the leader of Monmouthshire Council up to to chat with them. They brought their cabinet up. And that was the first time anyone from Monmouth had come to the Forest of Dean Council. That's I mean, That's you know, I mean it's just madness. It's, it's crazy that you even think that had happened, but it did. Okay, well, thanks very much for that, Tim. I'm going to go to Peter now. Pete, can you tell us about your company, please, um, uh, and what's been going on in your sort of sector? Yeah, well, uh, I mean, the, the, the sector has been under a lot of pressure during COVID. Um, ourselves, we were, were 30% down. So, sorry, um, can we just say what you actually do, sorry? The WCD Group is a hydration specialist company uh, nationwide. Um, we range from uh, point of use plumbed in water coolers to kettle taps, on wall boilers, countertop boilers. So, so all things hydration, including sparkling for catering. We've just recently gone through a relaunch of our business to the WCD group. Previously, we were water coolers direct. And, you know, initially that was great because it said what it done on the tin. Um, again, we're a company always looking to diversify. And now we're so much more than that. We're all about the whole of the whole hydration journey. Uh, and so the WCD group was an important change, step change in our direction. And we're specializing in kettle taps, hot taps, whether that's for, for the business or whether that's for the home. And we're really seeing a, a lot of growth. There's a lot of talk about, you know, people staying working from home and people want the same kind of luxuries that they enjoy in the workplace. And one of those, John, just before we come on, I was back far quicker than you making the tea because I've got a kettle. <laughs> I know. You know? Uh, and it's, it's just little things, but we, we are seeing a, a lot of growth and we're focusing a lot on uh, banned single-use plastic, reduced single-use plastic and sustainability, um, which, which is really key for, for the future of the world. How big is the company now? How many uh, we're a seven million pound uh, turnover company, and we employ forty nine people. Currently. And you've also you've taken some kickstarters on as well. Haven't we you? have indeed, and we're really proud of that. We've currently got six kickstarters with us, and we're looking. We still got spaces for a couple more opportunities, uh, and we've been so impressed with the guys that have come on board with us from the kickstarters perspective. They're there. They're really keen, and very often they just want that opportunity uh, and you know i think the kickstarters programs are really positive message for the young out there uh, to show them a, a, a route to get into business okay patrick thanks very much sorry pete thanks very much let's move to patrick patrick um trusted well. property obviously a yeah. property specialist um so we touched on it earlier what's the market like at the moment for you guys or what are you seeing personally um, well, it's incredibly buoyant, um, actually. Um, I both I, I talk then of I, I'm predominantly commercial property myself, um, but I talk of the residential market as well. When you read the papers, it's it's in your face really that uh, that's just gone bonkers. Um, there's an enormous amount of feeling that uh, that's due to the stamp duty uh, holiday that we've currently got. Um, but actually, strangely enough, um, Telegraph 
in the business comment today, uh, there's a very, very good article there on page four. And that talks about the fact that the underlying market is still very strong, particularly, well, on both residential and commercial. Um, they're saying that the investors are still in there. One of the big things uh, in the investment market is that they, they watch out for yields, obviously, in the commercial side. And they also watch out for the economy and inflation. And the one thing that will protect them in terms of inflation is property. Um, so there's still a lot of cash out there likely to be available for property investment, um, commercial in particular. They're going to keep an eye on the uh, available or the usage of offices, as we talked about earlier, and whether or not there is going to be a drop in space. But there's plenty of evidence there that um, one man or one business's big space, which they want to move out to smaller, is the next business's drop down in size. And I think with it being swings and roundabouts, some have done very well. There's big big expansions in some of the businesses so they need more space you know as a result of covid so the the, the future is still bright um the resi side i noticed actually an article in the mail where they were talking about the great outdoors um meaning the gardens and balconies on flats and you know any bit of outdoor space that you can create uh, as a little bit of a haven to your property is always going to be a good thing um post covid and it's what people want. So, um, but aside of that, I think the stamp duty obviously will get, um, will come back and will go back on. Um, I think there will be an adjustment in that market because people perhaps, what they saved in stamp duty, they put on the value of the house instead. So that was part of the, the rise. So I think we might see an adjustment there, but by all accounts, I think from what I hear and what I see, that's gonna be fairly marginal or a fairly short period of time provided the economy does keep going in the right direction when, when lockdown is lifted. I, that Fantastic. Be that, that's, that's a brilliant overview of what's going on. Thanks ever so much. I'm going to move on to Jonathan now. Jonathan, uh, you started your business in the middle of the pandemic. Is you still there, Jonathan? <laughs> at, the, at, at the very beginning of it, to be precise, yes. And, uh, uh, well, it's something I'd done before and I had the opportunity to restart and the, how's it gone? Uh, uh, sales consultancy so what i've been it's gone really well uh, it, it, fair to say the first three months the april may and june i, I hit target but the target was zero um because that was obviously <laughs> when the whole, whole world was locked down the the element of me helping get into businesses and i a kind of a sales coach mentor trainer someone who goes in looks at a business looks at what could be done differently not hugely it just sometimes it's small incremental changes that have had a dramatic effect so my client base has benefited uh, some of them have just it's just been about going back to basics with sales people forget uh, and i say sales is very much like a, a sport you wouldn't expect Gloucester Rugby's turn up on a Saturday without training for five days, being coached and mentored and, and tutored about that specific game. Obviously, Peter's very were, were well aware of this. Um, but lots of salespeople, sales managers, sales directors just expect their staff to rock up to that meeting without preparation, training, and, and then post uh, meeting kind of analysis to find out what's going on. And it's very dynamic. So, just helping companies think about that, work through that, has had um, some dramatic effects in different areas. And rock up like this morning, you mean, Jonathan? Just rock up like this morning. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and my other little sideline is I, I do help uh, uh, Pi Piper. So I'm on the promo board of Pi Piper, which obviously you support massively, Mark. And I know you say this, Peter, as well. But... No, that's fantastic. And congratulations, by the way. You, you, you've really sort of been motoring along. I've uh, we, We've talked a lot over this last 18 months or 15 months, whatever it's been. And uh, you just seem to be everywhere, which is... What you have to do when you when you first launch a business. Anyway, we're going to move on very very quickly because we're kind of running out of time, guys. We're going to quickly go over to what's caught your eye in this week's punchline. Let's start with you first of all, Tim, Pizza, Patrick, and back to you, Jonathan. Very quickly, Tim, what's caught your eye in this week's punch? It was in uh, Wednesday's actually. There's a bit fuel prices rising again, uh, Mark, and obviously in a very rural area like like um, like we are there in the forest, that has a big effect effect on us then here. Um, apparently they've gone up every every month for seven months and it's the highest highest rise um, for 11 years. Now I used to remember we used to recall why rises happened. There was usually some trouble in the Middle East or, or some sort of embargo or something 
I don't recall any of that in the last 12 months. So quite why it's going up, I think, is a bit of a mystery. I think they probably need to make some money after no cars on the roads. <laughs> Peter, what's uh, what's your story, please, Quarters? I, I touched on it earlier. It, it was just about the, the journey of Zoom and how pre-COVID it was a you know relatively unknown business. Uh, and now they released profits in the first quarter of something like £400 million. Um, and and the, the journey is incredible, but it's, it's just touching on, is it here to stay? I believe it is. One of the massive benefits it's brought to our company is we employ 20 engineers nationwide. Instead of them having to read the minutes of a staff meeting, they're now logging in and taking part via Zoom on the staff meeting. So it, in some respect, it's been a real game changer for us. And I think it is here to, to stay in a balance, but but it's just about, we talk about growth and and Tim, we talk about a bit of bubbly for the shareholders at the Christmas party. I think they'll be having a lot of bubbly this year. Thanks very much. Patrick, <laughs> what have you got for us, please? Yeah, I think it was yesterday's actually, you reported um, small construction businesses in financial distress, um, estimated 100,000 of them in the UK. I think that's um, quite a serious issue, really. And we were talking about shopping local earlier. And of course, you know, there's a danger, isn't there, if those headlines go out, that we then go looking for bigger businesses that are not in distress. And the bigger businesses can often be international and suddenly, you know, there, there's a, a change of form and our local businesses who might be classified within, within this um, category are, are in trouble and we're not supporting them. And I think we just need to bear this one in mind because we've got an enormous amount going on in the county um, construction wise over the next five, 10 years. And, you know, these are a very, very important businesses in that chain. Um, and they're struggling, and they're struggling also with materials because the prices of building materials are, go, are rocketing at the moment. If, if they can get them, there's scarcity as well. So, so I think that's a, a really serious point that, that is one to watch and, and one that um, we could all help them a lot more if we were using local businesses for construction purposes. So that was that caught my eye. Thanks very much, Patrick. Jonathan, what's caught your eye in this week's punchline? Well, it started for a sad bit. It's about the fire that happened at Long Hope, uh, the old Richard Reed uh, premises. It's sad that someone set a business up. I, I didn't realise how much development had been done there by Roger Head and Jim Ruddy, who bought it. So two local people. So this isn't a conglomerate buying a, a business. That it was a transport yard. They converted it, and Tim made no more, to X number of offices and created a number of jobs which I think is a fantastic success story, but has only been blighted by, unfortunately, a little setback with this fire. No, totally agree. Totally agree. And I, I talked to Roger and uh, m myself that day as well. Uh, he was kind enough to make sure that he gave us an interview. And uh, as you can imagine, he was, uh, well, he's heartbroken, but he was very, very pragmatic about it all, really, and, and just just uh, making sure that he wants to drive that business forward. At the end of the day, it's 200,000 square feet. It's very important for the Forest of Dean. It really is. There's some big businesses going to go in. We need to make sure that, that uh, you know, hopefully stays on track. The, uh, the story that caught my eye, guys, was the, the lack of hospitality staff, the lack of chefs, the, the waiters. The, you know, we've opened up. Yeah. There is a severe shortage of people, and especially in the hospitality sector. And I was talking to someone yesterday about it. Um, and um, they're talking about maybe restaurants and cafes and people not opening six days a week or, or seven days a week, but actually cutting down a couple of days in order to make sure that they can actually staff it. Um, being an ex-chef myself, I can fully understand why somebody who used to be a chef has found the delights of the weekends and not working so late uh, and not being abused and not being uh, uh, working so hard. It's a tough gig, I can tell you. Anyway, that's all we have time for today. Thanks very much for joining this Punchline Talks. Thanks for joining my fantastic panel, and we'll see you very soon. Cheers, bye.